I'm going to give a very short presentation, um, which is an update of the work that we've been doing in Library Labs over the last year or so. So let me go back to the definition of what is a glam lab or galleries, libraries, archives, museums lab. So um, the um, important thing, obviously, um, if you're not if you're new to this area, is to sort of understand what we mean by a lab. And in this context, it's we we define it as a space which is either online or on site to get people to experiment with. Um, that organization's digital collections, either the, whether they're digitized or born digital. Um, but the other thing I wanted to sort of add to this is it actually needs people to run it. And I think over the last year, we've inv I think we've invented a new word called the LABA. Um, you might want to check that out online. Um, maybe somebody's already used it. But um, which sort of gets to the heart of what we're trying to achieve within these labs. And um, the Really, we're, what we're trying to do is in, in open up our collections, encourage an experimental approach, sometimes take risks, also look at the barriers that exist within our organisations. And a term that my colleague, I think Sophie used, formalised disobedience, I think that was you. Um, I, I love that term. Sometimes uh, you have to do things the way they're probably not meant to be done, just to see how they work. Um, so we kind of sit in this space where we're about transformation because increasingly more of the work that we do is in digital form. Um, and one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of, it's a plea to all of you, is to seek your inner labour amongst yourselves, to sort of that, that playful experimental side of you. Um, that's, that's really the kind of people that we, we end up working with. So... Um, just to sort of summarize the work that we do and how we try to connect people, um, we have our audience, which, which are you and your interest, and these are our digital collections. And often people have uh, certain preconceptions or misunderstandings of how, how much of our collections are actually digitized. At the British Library, our, only 3% of our physical collections are digitized, which means that we're constantly working at this sweet spot, which is trying to match what all the audience are interested in and the collections we have. And for the last six years, we've been spending a lot of time trying to match that sweet spot. Um, often when we go to events around the UK or around the world, um, people ask us whether we have specific collections digitized, and almost always the answer is no. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is showing what we actually have and seeing if that can start a conversation. And often that involves lots of hard intellectual engagement. Um, and sometimes it feels like the collections that we have at the library are a kind of a, a mixed bag of things and sometimes surprising. So trying to get that interest involves uh, lots of conversations and talking to people. So how have we done this over the years? Um, at the very beginning, when I started um, at Labs, um, we ran a competition, which was uh, encouraging people to come up with ideas of things to do with our digital collections. And um, we still kind of get involved in competitions, but that's sort of morphed into, into much more specific things. So a few years ago, I was involved in a, in a fashion competition, for example, encouraging fashion students to use our digital collections. But, Increasingly, what we do now is we encourage people to explore our collections first, and then once they've explored our collections and kind of had a better understanding of what's actually in there, um, and that's we, we really strongly recommend you do that because um, people often misunderstand what's, what we have. It's only once they start to dig in and actually look at what we have, they begin to then understand what they can actually do. Um, so we have a, um, a method of support for people who've explored our collections where you can actually submit an idea of, so an idea that you would actually like to explore further. Um, so uh, we offer up to five days support and what, what, what we recommend first is that you actually explore our collections first. Part of today um, is about recognising things people have already done with our collections and um, for today, we're going to be covering a number of categories, research, artistic learning and teaching, and a staff category. 
And this was a real a cunning plan, really, uh, when we started running these awards, was because um, it was really trying to identify what people are actually doing out there. And it's much easier to convince people to come up with ideas to do th things with our collections when you actually show them an example of what other people have already done. And finally, we, we work on collaborative projects, which uh, genuinely starts most of the time um, with a conversation. And we do lots of engagement. Uh, we go out a lot. We uh, run roadshows. We have events, meetings, and, and conversations. Here's just a, a quick summary. Uh, this is an update of a slide we showed last year. Um, it just sort of gives you an idea of sort of the... There's lots of numbers there. I won't go through all of them. But really what it represents is that over the last six years, we've had to do a lot of engagement in order to get people to do interesting things with our collections. Probably the highlight for me out of that list is the fact that we've probably supported about over 160 projects, um, working with researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, and educators doing interesting things with our collections. Um, and also my colleague Sophie is going to be talking about some work that Labs has been involved with which is actually spreading our experience, knowledge and expertise to a sort of wider community. And what we're discovering is that more and more labs are being created in lots of organizations like galleries, archives, um, libraries, archives and museums. So just a quick update on where we are with funding and the transition for labs. We've been running for six years now. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I think this is not a bold claim, but uh, we were the first national library in the world to have a digital innovation lab for its digital collections. Um, for six years, we were funded largely by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation with some contributions from the British Library. And now we're moving into a stage where our funding is coming exclusively from the British Library for the next two years. So what we're doing is trying to understand which what services we, have, we are developing that can be business as usual as part of the everyday workings of the library. We still uh, want to have a space for uh, experimentation and incubation. And um, just to sort of give you an update on staffing, um, my colleague Adam Farquhar, who's the head of digital scholarship and was the principal investigator for BL Labs, uh, left in September 2019. And he's actually back. I can see him in the audience. There he is. Um, also, Eleanor Cooper uh, got a promotion. Uh, she's now the inter International Engagement Manager. And Felipe Bento is now our new technical lead. Felipe, do you want to? He'll be chairing um, uh, the afternoon session. Maya, who uh, introduced the um, event, welcomed everyone, it, um, manages me, so she's part of the labs team. So we have two full-time staff. And what's interesting is that because we've been sharing our expertise and knowledge and experience across the world, we can benchmark how we're doing against other institutions. So I look rather jealously at Library of Congress that have now 10 stroke 11 people in their labs. So not jealous or anything, but you know. <laughs> um, so some of the highlights from this year include uh, an exhibition that Labs was involved in. Uh, it was called the Imaginary Cities Exhibition. And it was working with a contemporary artist called Michael Takio Magruder, who's an artist, researcher, slash cultural remixer. And what Michael did was to take four uh, digitized um, city maps uh, from the 19th century, namely New York, London, Paris, and Chicago, and try to look at the way the public were interacting with those maps online and finding a way to use that inter interaction data um, together with his own artistic aesthetic to create new works. And this, is, this was manifested as an exhibition. Uh, here are some pictures of this. Um, um, Michael actually created two physical artworks and two, two digital artworks. We're sort of slightly conservatively estimating the numbers around about 150,000 visitors we had. The, the exhibition was actually extended from July to the 1st of September. Um, there is also a limited edition uh, Imaginary Cities book. Um, I have a box of them. I, I was going to say you can win one, but uh, if you just speak to me nicely, I'll give you a copy. Okay. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick teaser video, uh, just to sort of give you a flavor of what, what the exhibition involved.
Um, also, um, those of you that have been here, uh, been here a few times may remember in two at the 2017 um, symposium, we ran something called a mini algo rave. Hands up who knows what a mini what an algo rave is. A few of you, okay, good. Um, effectively, the artist generates music live through live programming, so um, using various bits of software. Uh, and we gave a talk uh, in 2000. Uh, we invited um, two people to, to give a talk, Carol, uh, Coral Manton and Joanna Armitage, to give a talk. And we gave them the challenge of performing our data in the foyer. Uh, we even handed out glow sticks, if anybody remembers that um, infamous event. Um, the idea was that we were planting a seed for one day having a much larger algo rave, which we actually did do um, as part of the public launch for Imaginary Cities. And it was an incredibly successful event. Um, and I think that's, I don't think you can actually read that tweet, um, but that's from Tim Hitchcock, who's on our advisory board, saying the grand claim, making the grand claim it was the largest ever algo rave held in a national library in the world. <laughs> With, with 700 people, but it was a great night. Um, and uh, it's really sort of, sort of giving an example of the kinds of things we're experimenting with. So just to sort of summarize um, some future work that we're working on, uh, we're doing a revamp of our portal called data.bl.uk. Uh, we're moving a lot of our content to an open access repository that is imminent. The, the, the data will be moved, uh, moved over. Um, we're also going to include descriptions of on-site only available collections. Um, we're just about to open up some digital research spaces to, for, for researchers to get access to on-site only available collections. Um, we've been doing some work with the Royal Danish Library and the UK Web Archive to implement something called Jupyter Notebooks um, on-site for our on-site only avail available collections. Jupyter Notebooks are kind of browser-based um, environments where you can write code and execute the code live, and it talks to a data set, and the results are displayed within, within the browser. We're very excited about this because we're doing some testing, and we've managed to get this working on all reading room PCs in the library. We're continuing to do engagement across the world and develop projects. Um, we, we're, we're doing a lot of work now on embedding our data on courses. So we've done some experiments of working with schools all the way through to higher education, embedding our data as part of courses, and that's been very successful. Um, we're continuing to help build a global lab labs, Glam Labs community, and, and Sophie, my colleague, is going to talk a bit more about that after me. And we're also examining further fundraising and expanding the team.